So if you're a dominant male, you can expect your stress hormones to be low. And if you're submissive, much higher. But there was an even more revealing find. In Sapolsky's sample, low rankers, the have-nots, had increased heart rates and higher blood pressure. This was the first time anyone had linked stress to the deteriorating health of a primate in the wild. Basically, if you're, you know, a stressed, unhealthy baboon in a typical troop, high blood pressure, elevated levels of stress hormones, you have an immune system that doesn't work as well, your reproductive system is more vulnerable to being knocked out of whack, your brain chemistry is one that bears some similarity to what you see in clinically depressed humans, and all that stuff, uh, those are not predictors of a hale and hearty old age. Could this also be true for that other primate? As Robert Sapolsky was monitoring stress in baboons, Professor Sir Michael Marmot was leading a study in Great Britain that tracked the health of more than 28,000 people over the course of 40 years. It was named for Whitehall, citadel of the British Civil Service, where every job is ranked in a precise hierarchy the perfect laboratory to determine whether in humans there might be a link between rank and stress. I mean, that's the thing about stress. I think you've got to look at it in both acute terms and chronic terms. And I think I've been under chronic stress in this organization simply because I'm a square peg in a round hole. Kevin Brooks is a government lawyer. His rank, level seven, means he has little seniority in his department. He lives the life of a subordinate. I think what I was most aware of at the time was the workload and how I had most of it under control, but one of my cases wasn't wholly under control. I'd let it slip. And it was a bit like, um, you know, in being in a car and hitting an ice patch and skidding. But nonetheless, I came in Monday morning and my immediate manager, let's call him Ben, Ben wants a word with you. So we find a room, he shuts the door, then he says, you know what you've done. You know what happened while you were away. We couldn't find one of your files. Do you know what that meant? He just gave me a darn good kicking, you know? Psychologically, he did me over. And at the end of it, it was more threats. It was, right, this may be a disciplinary matter. So I left the room, crossed over the corridor to my own room, and I just burst into tears and wept and wept. Sarah Woodall also works for the government. Unlike Kevin, she is a senior civil servant. There are about 160 people reporting to me ultimately, one way or another, within the sector. I do really enjoy working in the civil service. It's quite a dynamic environment. It can be quite exciting. Um, I like working with lots of people. Uh, so yeah, I, I do really enjoy my job. Such dramatically different reflections dramatize one of the most astounding scientific findings in the Whitehall study. Firstly, it showed that the lower you were in the hierarchy, the higher your risk of heart disease and other diseases. So people second from the top had higher risk than those at the top. People third from the top had higher risk than those second from the top. And it ran all the way from top to bottom. We're dealing with people in stable jobs with no industrial exposures, and yet your position in the hierarchy intimately related to your risk of disease and length of life. I've been very lucky. I, I haven't ever experienced any problems with my health. Um, since I've been in the senior, senior civil service, I haven't had a day off with ill health. So I've been very fortunate. In my own situation, I think that my career is pretty much um, tainted. It's pretty much arrested because I've had, for instance, out of the last three years at work, I've been off sick for probably half that time. This particular study is sort of the Rosetta Stone of the whole field because it's the British civil service system. Everybody's got the same medical care. 
Everybody's got the same universal health care system, just like the baboons. All the baboons eat the same thing, they have the same level of activity. It's not the stuff that, oh, if you're a low-ranking baboon, you smoke too much and you drink too much. And if you're a low-ranking British civil service guy, you never go to the doctor and you don't get prevented of vaccines. Both of these studies rule out all those confounds and they produce virtually identical findings. On both sides of the primate divide, there are soul-wrenching stories and life-threatening consequences. For every subordinate like Kevin, living a life of baboon uncertainty, there is an alpha strutting his stuff, glorying in power over someone else, someone unsuspecting, someone low-ranking. Twelve forty-six. Do either of you see where the dart is? Yeah, I do. Okay, guys, who do you think's higher ranking? Our guy. Yeah. Watch carefully. Make sure the other guy doesn't hassle him. This up, year, up, up. Robert brought his family to Africa. His wife, neuropsychologist Lisa Sher Sapolsky, has also done extensive research with baboons. And for the first time, they brought along their kids, Benjamin and Rachel. As asleep as he looks. You know, all the baboons are perfectly willing to get very freaked out by a human coming over and touching one of these guys, but cover him with a burlap and he doesn't exist anymore. Oh my God, he's there, he's up. Oh, not there anymore. So this is not quite like take your kids to work day, but you know, this is a pretty central feature of who I am by now and who my wife and I are. And you know, if our kids want to know where we came from, this is pretty fundamental. As in previous seasons, Robert measures how individuals at every level of the baboon hierarchy react to and recover from stress. So what we're doing, we're now going to challenge the system with increasing doses of epinephrine. The baboon's response is immediately picked up in its blood. Vital signs that can be deep frozen in perpetuity. It's this storehouse of potential knowledge and I got 30 years of those blood samples frozen away at this point because you never know when some new hormone or some new something or other pops up and that's the thing to look at and start pulling out those samples back to when, you know, Jimmy Carter was president. 150 and 25. Anticipating the long reach of stress is a recent idea. For when Robert was Rachel's age, scientists believed stress was the cause of only one major problem. This is a picture of a major American personnel problem. An ugly sore that doctors call a peptic ulcer, eating away at the wall of a man's stomach. Those stomach pains that you talk about, the gnawing, the burning, those are obvious symptoms of gastric ulcer. 30 years ago, what's the disease that comes to everybody's mind when you mention stress? It's ulcers. Stress and ulcers, stress and ulcers. And this was the first stress-related disease discovered, in fact, 70 years ago. What I want you to do is to work on your attitude. My attitude? That's right. Ulcers breed on the wrong kind of feelings. You've got to be honest with yourself about the way you feel about things. Finding a new doctor sounds like a better answer to me. The connection between stress and ulcers was mainstream medical gospel until the early 1980s. Then, Australian researchers identified a bacteria as the major cause of ulcers. And this overthrew the entire field. This was, it's got nothing to do with stress. It's a bacterial disorder. And I'm willing to bet half the gastroenterologists on Earth when they heard about this went out and celebrated that night. This was like the greatest news. Never again were they going to have to sit down there, patients, and make eye contact and ask them how's it going. So anything stressful, it's got nothing to do with stress. It's a bacterial disorder. 
So no longer would the solution be stress management. Now it could be something as simple as a pill.